Hello and welcome to the third episode of Franklin, the City Skyline series where we build a city over time instead of building it all at once. Now as I'm recording this, only the first episode is up and uh, I'd like to thank you for all your kind comments and all your views on the YouTube. I don't know what you may have thought of the uh, Mercantilism episode, which was last episode, because that hasn't happened yet in my timeline. But I do want to say, if you have a problem with my political views or uh, any of my views on urban development, please feel free to uh, message me and come to my house and fight me. Um, but I'd also like to mention that uh, recently Uwe Ball followed me on Twitter and uh, I saw what you did to low tax. So um, if you have a problem, Uwe, with my uh, urban development views, uh, I concede. Uh, and if you're going to do the City Skylines movie, I'm here to help. Anyway. So I'd like to thank my colleague, Mr. B. Squicklehausen, for uh, providing me with a new microphone. That's, that microphone is his old microphone, but it's still better than my previous microphone, which was labeled entirely in Chinese and uh, which only recorded pops and scratches and hisses. So anyway, back to the subject. We've skipped a few years since the last episode. Let's bring you up to speed. New Norway was conquered by the Dutch. The Dutch, in turn, have been conquered by the British. If you thought I'd try and show combat or talk about it in more detail, y'all should probably be following uh, streams of other Paradox games. In the intervening time, uh, we have to talk about a man named William Franklin. He received a large amount of land in the New World as repayment for debts incurred by the crown, and he quickly migrated to the New World to settle his claim and found the city of Franklin. This is the part where we finally talk about some urban planning. Now, urban planning, especially in this era, is an art, not a science. Those city skylines would have you believe that 90% of urban planning is traffic engineering, and though urban planning was practiced as such for most of the 20th century, the field is far more closely related to architecture than any engineering discipline. Now, I learned one extremely important thing in my architecture history courses, and it's this. To talk effectively about architecture, you need an Eastman Kodak carousel slide projector. So uh, hold on a second while my grad student sets this up. Right, so today's lesson is a crash course on urban planning up to the late 17th century. I've provided a syllabus of links to required reading in the description. Now, pay attention to this, though. If I see more than three subscribers click away during this portion, there's going to be a pop quiz on the next video. And put your cell phones away. Now, we're going to start about as far back as recorded history can tell us. Uh, next slide, please with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Dating from the 18th century BC, it mentions the city of Uruk being three square miles, one square mile of city, one square mile of orchards, and one square mile of clay pits. Obviously, Gilgamesh is not an urban planning document. It's an epic. So uh, this is a very vague description of the city. So we need something we can actually look at, which uh, brings us to uh, next slide, please. Hippodamus of Miletus, the first recorded urban planner. He lived in the 5th century BC and is generally credited with the invention of the field of urban planning itself. Pictured here is the plan of Piraeus in Athens, which Hippodamus is credited with. As you can say, he came up with that dirtiest of words in the city skyline world. Next slide, please. Uh, Next slide. Oh, 
could you, uh, as I was saying, the dirtiest word in city skylines, the grid. It turns out that despite what casual players say on Reddit, grids aren't exclusive to North America. They were invented by an ancient Greek guy who realized that, incredibly, it would be easier to figure out how to get somewhere if the streets were laid out rationally. This idea promulgated throughout history, next slide, to the Etruscans at the town of Cayuna near Marzabato, near Bologna, next slide please, and out of the Etruscans came the ancient Romans and their standardized castra, or forts. The two main streets in each castrum, next slide please, were the Cardo and the Decumanus. The Cardo was the primary north-south street, and the Decumanus was the primary east-west street. Near their intersection, next slide please, would be the Forum. Evidence of the grid is not evident in the city of Rome itself, next slide please, but it can be seen in many former Roman cities like Florence. However, as can be seen from the picture, the grid has decayed and become crooked since the Roman era. Other Roman and ex-Roman cities discarded their grids altogether, in fact. Next slide, please. Through the medieval period, cities had narrow, crooked streets, no running water, open sewers, rampant crime and villainy, and widespread poverty. As the Renaissance dawned, next slide, please. Italian Renaissance artists and thinkers began to think there was a better way to structure cities. Many attempted to paint the ideal city, but actual interventions into urban space were incremental. Next slide, please. The obsession with order and urban planning ran into a roadblock with regard to another obsession, property rights. Individual buildings like Brunelleschi's Ospedale della Innocentes exemplified Renaissance order, but its overall environment remained medieval. This was true of many Renaissance interventions, next slide please, where a more attractive facade was applied, or partially applied, but the overall structure remained medieval in character and construction. To fully implement the Renaissance ideal city, a whole city would have to be built from scratch. Of course, by the time our city of Franklin was founded, next slide please, Pope Sixtus V had managed to overcome pesky property rights and was well underway with reconstructing Rome in the new Baroque style, uh, with diagonal avenues oriented around focal point landmark structures. These ideas, however, next slide please, had not propagated to our founder, William Franklin. Planning a whole city from scratch was unheard of in England, of course, but he set out to do it anyway. The plan William Franklin came up with was similar to a Roman castrum, but bigger and with a central square instead of a forum. This plan is typical of contemporary towns in the Mid-Atlantic. Similar center squares can be found in York, Hanover, Gettysburg, Lancaster, Reading, Allentown, and so on. While the streets may not be aligned precisely north-south or east-west, and while they have names like Market Street, Broad Street, Main Street, High Street, or so on, they're clearly derived from the, Roman, from the Roman Cardo and Decumanus. In addition to the center square, though, four large squares were planned for the common use of the citizens, in keeping with Franklin's vision of Franklin being a green country town. Each large block was supposed to be divided into relatively few large lots, creating a low-density town with grand houses on productive land or green lawns and gardens. It was to be a grand experiment in both urban planning and social planning. Franklin planned for absolute religious tolerance, owing to his own experience as a Quaker, and to make peace with the Lenape, buying the land fairly instead of seizing it by force. Wide streets would rationally and effectively move pedestrians, horses, and carts. The green country town would become the administrative center of William Franklin's colonial possessions.
Unfortunately, the city of Franklin's prime location on a navigable river, leading to a well-sheltered bay, trashed plans for a green country town almost immediately. New landowners near the port, which was the center of all activity in Franklin owing to its colonial mercantilist export-based economy, immediately went about subdividing their properties to create row houses. These road houses included enormous Georgian townhouses for the richest residents and tiny Trinity houses, so named for their three rooms stacked atop each other, for servants and their families. Densities around the port area exploded, while streets farther away remained empty or could support only agriculture. So who are all these folks moving in? William Franklin himself was a Quaker, and a few Quakers came with him to settle the original plots. But with the explosion in trade came many immigrants from England, of course, but also many from Ireland and Germany. But how did they get here when transportation was so expensive? There were two ways you could get to the colonies if you were poor, either penal transportation or indentured servitude. Or the Atlantic slave trade, but you generally didn't have a choice in that matter. We'll talk about that in a bit. Indentured servitude worked as follows. You entered into a contract with a wealthy person, and you would be transported to the colonies in exchange for a fixed period of unpaid servitude to said wealthy person. This was typically a period of five to seven years, uh, sometimes less if you knew a skilled trade like blacksmithing. To become an indentured servant, you had to be bound before a magistrate back in England and testify that the contract was voluntary. However, this was only if you were over 21. If you were under 21, your parent or guardian had an almost full control of your fate. Children were regularly, effectively sold into servitude in the colonies, by their parents to repay debts or otherwise make some much-needed cash. Now, these contracts typically specified that the child was to be an apprentice rather than a servant, and usually expired once the child reached age 21 or 18 if they were a girl. Apprentice, of course, implied some education in the skilled trade, but indentured apprentices frequently found themselves doing manual labor in the fields or in the mines anyway. There were also redemptioners. These are immigrants who took passage on a ship as a human COD. They would pay their way by seeking indenture upon arrival in the colonies. They were held on the ship until a buyer arrived for them, or offloaded and presented at what were effectively slave markets, but for indentured servants. The going price typically about five British pounds. This was the most common arrangement for uh, early German immigrants. Now, penal transportation works similarly to indentured servitude. To avoid a harsh prison sentence, or even capital punishment, the convicted could instead be transported to the colonies to work off their debt to society through indenture. This afforded you no monetary compensation, so transportation was typically a one-way trip. Penal transportation is more commonly associated with Australia, but the practice started far earlier in the American colonies. Crimes punishable by transportation were numerous, from burglary to treason. Generally, it followed the same process as redemptioners. Prisoners were sold at market, but around 5 to 10 British pounds, depending on if they had a 7 or 14 year sentence. Now, notably, 10,000 or more Irishmen were transported after the Irish Confederate Wars, uh, after around 1653. If you've ever heard the term Irish slavery, they're referring to that specific incident, and more broadly, white slavery is a term which refers to indentured servitude. Now, it's important to note that these terms are wrong, misleading, and trivialize actual African slavery in the United States. Uh, indentured servitude is bad and uh, an exploitive labor practice. 
You were very nearly someone else's property during the term of servitude. You had very few legal rights. However, it was at least theoretically entered into consensually, and it always had a fixed term, and the only person it could affect was your own self. This is why it's important to draw a distinction between indentured servitude and penal transportation versus actual chattel slavery as practiced in the colonies and the early United States. American chattel slavery was one of the most brutal forms of slavery ever practiced in history. It made most forms of Roman slavery look like a goddamn lifetime spa treatment. So typically you'd be kidnapped from your village by Europeans or by a rival tribe, put on a slave ship in appalling conditions where you went starving and naked for a month or more at sea to arrive at a slave market in the Americas where you were sold to someone for somewhere around 200 British pounds. The uh, discrepancy in price between a slave and an indentured servant was because a slave was bound in servitude for life and so were any of their children, or grandchildren, or great-grandchildren, and so on. The uh, a buyer was paying for many lifetimes of labor. As a slave, you were property for life. You had no rights under the legal system whatsoever. You had no recourse against your master if you were treated poorly. You were legally classified as livestock, effectively. The only way out was to physically escape... And uh, with slavery still legal in what we call the North at this time, there was essentially nowhere to escape to. So uh, what some people call white slavery was extremely bad, but actual chattel slavery was unimaginably worse and lasted for many decades longer. Most folks saying white slavery either don't know what it really refers to or are actively trying to apologize for the Confederacy or, most frequently, trying to diminish the importance and long-term effects of slavery and oppression of African Americans in the United States, and uh, furthermore, trivialize African American grievances related to that. So, uh, I would say it's best to keep the uh, white slavery term quarantined back at Infowars.com and uh, stick with indentured servitude. The point in telling you all this, of course, is that the bulk of migrants, both forced and unforced, who are arriving in Franklin are here for one reason, to be cheap and exploitable labor. Both slaves and indentured servants served in domestic duties, but also in industrial and agricultural roles inside and outside the city. Indentured servitude and slavery are a level below the subsistence wages mentioned in the previous episode. Your master provided you directly with what food and lodgings he deemed appropriate, uh, no wages needed. And, of course, you worked hours your master felt were appropriate, and were disciplined as your master felt appropriate, and both indentured servants and slaves could be sold to another master at your master's pleasure, and so on and so on. Any mercantilist would see exploitation like this and be delighted. Though it is important to note that typically indentured servants were treated better than slaves for the simple reason that they would one day become free and then their master would have to deal with them on a more equal footing. So what industries were these indentured servants and slaves employed in? And near the port there would be various shops specializing in repairs to sailing ships. There would be primitive textile mills. There would be blacksmith shops. There'd be other shops specializing in various goods required around the city. Uh, probably the most important industry in this era, though, was distilling. Further west, in the lands of the Susquehannock Native Americans, fertile and flat land was cultivated by uh, European settlers. The area had abundant amounts of rain, and uh, rain, of course, makes corn. Corn makes whiskey, and whiskey makes my baby feel a little frisky. The reason the distillery was so important to the city is simple. A crop of corn is bulky and cannot be transported long distances cost-effectively, uh, without at least without some kind of canal or railroad, neither of which exist yet. Corn cannot be effectively transported by sea as of yet either. It's uh, bulky, 
it can rot fairly easily in the hold. Um, it's not particularly valuable either. The easiest way to correct all of these problems is to distill the corn into whiskey. Now, according to W.J. Rarbach's The Alcoholic Republic, a bushel, or about nine gallons of corn, selling at 25 cents a bushel, could be distilled into 2.5 gallons of whiskey, selling at a dollar and 25 cents. And unlike corn, whiskey could be shipped long distances at a profit, since it's lower maintenance. Now, whiskey was valuable for two reasons. Uh, number one, whiskey was an informal currency in the uh, cash-starved colonies. And two, colonial Americans were habitually drunk. Though consumption would not peak until the period 1830 through 1836 at 4.7 gallons of distilled spirits consumed per year per capita, or about one and a half shots a day, consumption per capita was still significantly higher than it is today. A habit of imbibing a quart a day was not uncommon, and it was not even considered unhealthy. Obviously, those with money did most of the drinking, while laborers bought what they could, uh, when they could. That is, if they weren't paid in liquor, which was more common than being paid in money, since so much hard currency had a habit of leaving the colony. So welcome to Franklin, a spacious green country town of social and religious tolerance, with dirt streets and open sewers, full of drunk slaveholders and liberal chattel slaves, with fewer rights than the livestock which still roam the streets. Row houses abut mills and waste dumps, and pavement or even cobblestone is a distant dream. People are put up at auction each day, disease is rampant, so is crime. The brand new city proved to have all the problems of the medieval towns it intended to improve upon, and then some. I'd love to say that improvements are forthcoming, but unfortunately, as we'll see in the next episode, things are going to get worse before they get better. <laughs>